so um, this morning we will be in uh, Genesis chapter 22. Uh, this morning, Genesis chapter 22. And um, the title of the message this morning is um, Faithful Obedience. Um, Faithful Obedience. And as many of you know, on Wednesdays, we've been going through the book of Genesis um, with the men. And uh, this morning, as we go through the book of Genesis here together, chapter 22 specifically, if you remember the last time I was up here, we talked a little bit about like maturing in our faith, maturing in our walk. And also we talked a little bit about building the church and as our role, our role as church members and individuals, how we're going to build the kingdom of God. And that's when we looked at 1 Corinthians um, chapter 3, and it was about two weeks ago. And ultimately, for those things to happen, for us to mature in our walk and for us to build God's, God's kingdom, we have to be obedient to the Lord. But obedience is only possible if we have faith in the Lord, right? You can't do something unless you have faith in the person who's telling you or telling you to do something. And this is going to be explained to us here very nicely to the life of Abraham, as Abraham in this chapter will face one of the biggest or maybe the ultimate test of obedience and faith through his son um, Isaac. So here... The Lord is not enticing Abraham to do wrong, because if you look in the book of James, or the letter, the epistle of James, it tells us there in the first chapter that God doesn't tempt us with evil, but rather we tempt ourselves by our own desires, and then when we get into those desires, it becomes sin, and that leads um, to death. However, the Lord does allow difficulties, trials into our lives that shape us and mold us, they build patience and endurance. Those are the things that the Lord does allow. And here, what we're going to see is that the Lord is seeking to see the quality of Abraham's um, faith. And this morning, the question becomes, what is the quality of your faith? What is the quality of my faith? And this is something we want to think about as we continue improving the quality of our faith, as we grow together as brothers and sisters in Christ. So before we actually get into the study, let me uh, open up in prayer. We'll read the text, and then we'll look at this um, verse by verse. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for your word, Lord, and your word is truth. Our faith, Lord, is in your word, and this morning we pray that you would just speak to us through your word, that you would use it to shape us and mold us. Help us to have understanding, Lord. Fill us, fill this place with your Holy Spirit that we would know you more, Lord, that we would love you more. And we thank you so much for just the privilege of knowing you, but the fact, Lord, that we are considered children of the Most High. We love you, we praise you, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so Genesis chapter 22. And here, um, Moses records for us, it says here, After these things... God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, here I am, he answered. Take your son, he said, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. So Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took with him two of his young men and his son, Isaac. He split wood for a burnt offering and set out to go to the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there to worship. Then we'll come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. In his hand, he took the fire and the knife, and the two of them walked on together. Then Isaac spoke to his father, Abraham, and said, My father, and he replied, Here I am, my son. Isaac said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Then the two of them walked on together. When they arrived at the place that God had told him about, Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood. He bound his son Isaac and placed him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out and took the knife to slaughter his son. 
But the angel of the Lord called to him from, the he from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He replied, Here I am. Then he said, Do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your only son from me. Abraham looked up and saw the ram, saw a ram rather, caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering in place of his son. And Abraham named the place the Lord will provide. So today it is said, it will be provided on the Lord's mountain. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, this is the Lord's declaration. Because you have done this thing and have not withheld your only son, I will indeed bless you and make your offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your offspring will possess the city gates of their enemies, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed by your offspring because you have obeyed my command. Abraham went back to his young men, and they got up and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham settled in Beersheba. So I'll stop here for now. And um, what we see here, I'll put this here for now, is Abraham is about to face one of the greatest testings of his life, possibly here. And in the first few verses, what we are going to see here is God's command to Abraham, and then Abraham's response to that command. And this is the first um, three verses. So if you look at verse 1 and 2, here his faith is going to be tested says after these things so what it's being referred to here is after abraham had made a covenant with abimelech and he had settled in the region of beersheba it says here that god tested abraham and he said to him abraham here i am he answered he says take your son he said your only son whom you love go to the land of moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. So once again, what's happening here is that this test is not necessarily going to produce Abraham's faith, but it's going to test his faith. And, you know, the question is, where does our faith come from? Well, if you look in the book of Romans there in chapter 10, it's pretty specific in verse 17. It says, so then faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. So our faith comes from the word of God. Hebrews 11.1 1 speaks about our faith there. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So, it, you know, what's happening here, once again, is his faith is being tested. But the thing is, when your faith is tested, that means that your faith already has to be in place. So in other words, just like Abraham we have to be solidified in the Word of God. That way, when we go through those testings, as James tells us in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, it says there, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Not if, but when you fall into various trials. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, um, that you may be perfect and complete lacking nothing so in other words we have to have our faith in place and then when those various trials come that's when our faith is tested and this is what we see happening in abraham's life here and we know through the word of god that abraham he was a man of faith he had great faith in fact if you look in hebrews chapter 11 they're the author of hebrews documents for us and you know chapter 11 is is often referred to as the Hall of Faith chapter. And um, it's, a, it's a wonderful chapter, but here, beginning in verse 8, it says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going by faith, um, by faith rather, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country. Dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder 
and maker is God. So, you know, Abraham obviously um, was a man of faith. He was obedient to the Lord in many ways, but he was also disobedient in some ways to the Lord, as, as all of us are in this room. Right? There are going to be times where we, we don't listen to the Lord. Um, however, Abraham was a man of faith. And in this particular test, this particular trial that the Lord was bringing into his life, here his quality of faith um, was going to be tested. And as believers, we know that there are going to be seasons in our life when the quality of our faith is also going to be tested. And maybe you're going through a season right now where your faith is being tested. You know, maybe you're going through some financial hardships. Maybe, maybe you're going through a season of bad health. Maybe you've lost someone in your life recently. I know for me personally, seasons of bad health or having a loved one going through a season of bad health, those are seasons where our faith can truly, um, can truly be tested. And um, many of you know this, but several years ago, this is actually what led me back to El Paso. I was living in Colorado for several years, but my mom had a brain hemorrhage. And the Lord called me to come back to El Paso to act as a caregiver. I did it for two full years and then off and on for about another two years. But caregiving for my mom took a lot of faith. It really tested my faith as well. Um, I only knew how to be a son. I didn't know how to be a caregiver. And when you take that step of faith out of obedience to the Lord, all of those things that you need to fulfill that call will come together. But at the same time, it tests your faith. And I can tell you there were many days of loneliness, um, not knowing what you were doing, um, just losing hope in the, in the process of caregiving for a person who was no longer, who was completely different now. And, and you were trying to get this person well. And then you realize that, you know, the, all you can do is trust the Lord and have faith in the Lord. And um, it's all easier said than done. But those seasons are the ones that really test your faith because there your quality of faith is really, really revealed, like who you are as a believer. Were you really that person when you would say things? Now those things are being tested in your own life. Are you going to apply them as you are going through the same season that you've ministered other people in? So that was a big season for me. I know for you all in this room, there are many seasons in your life where your faith has been tested. But all I can say is keep looking up and holding on to God's promises, holding on to God's word, because that's all you can do. There's nothing else you can do. You have to let go of the things you can't control because it'll consume you. It'll make you go crazy. You have to just leave it with the Lord and just trust him. You see, the Lord never leaves us and he never forsakes, forsakes us. Isaiah 43, 2 tells us, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you and the rivers will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched and the flame will not burn you. You see, Isaac here was to be offered as a burnt offering. This was the Lord's request of Abraham. This was not an offering that would burn alive, but one that would first be sacrificed and then would be offered as a burnt offering unto the Lord. And, you know, this was a strange request of Abraham. You see, this was Abraham's only son in the sense that he was the son of promise. Right? I remember he had had Ishmael, and we'll talk a little bit more about him in a little bit. But this was a son of promise. If you remember, the Lord had made a covenant with Abraham. Right? If you look in Genesis chapter 15, there it speaks of this covenant that he had made with the Lord. And you know, some of the basic principles or promises that we see with this were offspring, were land, um, the blessing of Abraham himself, and the blessing of nations through Abraham, because Jesus would come through that linkage, through that promised son, Isaac. If you look in Genesis 15, verse 4 and verse 5, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to him, this is Abraham, this one will not be your heir. And there the Lord is speaking of Eliezer of Damascus. This is an individual that was born, this was a slave that was born in his um, household. But this was not going to be an heir of Abraham. Instead, one who comes from your own body, this is the Lord telling Abraham, will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look at the sky and count the stars. If you are able to count them, 
Then he said to him, your offspring will be that numerous. Now, Sarah was not able to fulfill that promise. She could not provide a child to Abraham, a son, to fulfill the promise. And if you remember in Genesis chapter 16, she took matters into her own hands. And what she did is she gave her Egyptian slave Hagar to Abraham to be his wife and to bear him a son, which she did. Um, and that's where Ishmael came into play. However, this individual was not the son of promise. It was Isaac who was a son of promise. And this impulsive act by Sarah, it resulted in some heartache and some drama. And um, we know that disobedience to the Lord is always going to lead to problems. It leads to more issues. And uh, we can all relate to this because there have been many times when I've been disobedient to the Lord. And my disobedience has not only impacted my life, but everybody around me as well. And we saw this with Sarah. There was issues all across the board. Now, in Genesis chapter 17, if you look there beginning in verse 15 through 22, it says, God said to Abraham, as for your wife Sarai, do not call her Sarai, for Sarah will be her name. I will bless her. Indeed, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and I will produce nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Abraham fell face down. Then he laughed and said to himself, can a child be born to a hundred year old man? Can Sarah, a 90 year old woman give birth? So Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael were acceptable to you. But God said, no, your wife, Sarah will bear you a son and you will name him Isaac. I will confirm my covenant with him as a permanent covenant for his future offspring. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will certainly bless him. I will make him fruitful and will multiply him greatly. He will father 12 tribal leaders and I will make him into a great nation. But I will confirm my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this time next year. When he finished talking with him, God withdrew from Abraham. And then if you look in Genesis chapter 18, um, Abraham and Sarah, they both hear this, or they're both reminded of this promise. Again, if you remember there in chapter 18, um, three visitors came to visit Abraham, if you remember. And Sarah overhears this reminder that she's going to bear a son named Isaac. And if you remember, she also laughed. Um, and in fact, Isaac, the name Isaac means laughter or, or he will laugh. And, um, you know, Isaac, remember, this was the son of promise. The name was very specific here. The Lord told them specifically what to name their son. And then there was also a very specific due date. So um, it's very clear here that Isaac was this son of, um, of promise. But what we're seeing here is the Lord is telling him, hey, I want you to kill your son, this son that I have made this promise through. And um, this is a very unusual request, I would say. And, you know, there was a specific place that the Lord told Abraham that he needed to take Isaac. Uh, but what's interesting here also, if you look back at, um, I think it's verse 2, where he says, your only son Isaac, whom you love, um, there, that's actually the first mention of love in the Bible, okay? And there, that is the love between a father and a son. And some of you in here, you have sons, and I want you to think about this. Think about your heart and the love that you have for your sons. And when you think about that, could you offer up your son as an offering for the Lord? <laughs> I asked my dad this. He's like, of course. <laughs> you know, um, of course he didn't mean it, you know, you know, for the Lord. You know, he's like, yeah, I would totally give you up. <laughs> um, he was joking. Uh, but think about the ultimate sacrifice of a son. Think about the Lord himself, who gave his only begotten son, Jesus. Is that something that you could do? Well, this is exactly the situation that Abraham is in right now. He was being asked to give up this only son that the promise that had been given to him was going to be fulfilled through. And he was in this situation. But if we look in the next verse here, verse 3, what we see is, is his response um, to this request. So verse 3, it says, so Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took with him two of his young men and his son Isaac. 
he split wood for a burnt offering and set it out to go to the place God had told him about. So Abraham, what does he do? Does he question the Lord? No, he, he, gets, he gets going without any hesitation. He gets up early in the morning. He probably got up at four, <laughs> four in the morning um, to, to carry out this command uh, for the Lord. And his obedience here is a result of his faith. He trusted the Lord. He trusted the promises that the Lord had given to him or had mentioned to him. And when you think about it, can you imagine how he felt? How did he feel? Like maybe he trusted the Lord, but like he didn't understand completely. Maybe he was completely perplexed. He was confused about the situation. I don't know how he felt. Um, I, I would probably be, you know, confused. I'd be like, well, wait, this is the son you had promised. And now you want me to, you know, give him up as an offering. But despite all of that emotion that can come and get in the way of doing the Lord's work that we have as humans, there was still obedience to the call. And we can certainly learn from this because obedience will always lead, will always be a result of faithfulness. Our faithfulness will stem the obedience. Now, in the next several verses, um, what we're going to see here is Abraham's actual offering of his son, um, Isaac. So if you look in verse 4, and we'll read up to verse 8 for, for now, what we see here is that Abraham makes his journey to this place of sacrifice for Isaac, all right? So it says here, beginning in verse four of, of um, Genesis 22, it says, on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there to worship. Then we'll come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering. He laid it on Isaac. In his hand, he took the fire and the knife, and the two of them walked on together. Then Isaac spoke to his father, Abraham, and said, My father. And he replied, Here I am, my son. Isaac said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Then the two of them walked on together. When they arrived at the place that God had told him about, Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood. He bound his son Isaac and placed him on the altar um, on top of the wood. Okay, so Abraham, um, he makes his way from Beersheba to what is modern day Jerusalem. Okay, he makes his way there. And the region of Moriah is typically associated with Mount Moriah. Uh, so, for example, if you look in 2 Chronicles there, um, I believe it's like in chapter 3, there it speaks of when Solomon began to build the first temple, and it was in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. So that's the region we're talking about. And it took him three days to get there, all right? But what's interesting is once he gets there, notice what he tells the two young men that he took with him. He tells them, the boy and I... We'll go over there to worship. Then we'll, we will, so that's plural, right? Like both of them will come back to you. And to me, when I read this, this is, this is beautiful. Because what we see here is it shows us his faith in the Lord. He truly believed that he would come back to these men with his son. Even though he was about to go sacrifice his son. And when you think about that, you know, did, did he know that God was going to allow him not to sacrifice his son? Did he believe God would maybe raise his son from the dead? Or like, what did he know? Somehow he knew that he would return with Isaac. And, you know, you know personally, I believe he was really holding on to those promises that he had given to him, that he had mentioned to him that would be coming through Isaac. So regardless, Abraham knew, I'm going to come back with Isaac. To these, to these two men. And once again, this is a beautiful glimpse of Abraham's heart and Abraham's um, faithfulness and obedience to the Lord. And unlike Abraham, when the Lord calls us sometimes to take those steps of faith, we, um, we often waver, don't we? We let a lot of things um, get in the way. 
And if you remember, remember when the angel Gabriel came to Mary and he, he appeared to her to tell her that she was going to be bearing a son, Jesus, right? Like the savior of the world. Um, what was her reaction? Well, if you look in the gospel of Luke there in chapter one, beginning in verse 34, it says that Mary asked the angel, how can this be? I'm a virgin. The angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come to you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy Child developing inside you will be called the Son of God. Elizabeth, your relative, is six months pregnant with a son in her old age. People said she couldn't have a child, but nothing is impossible for God. So even though Abraham was there to sacrifice Isaac, in his mind, he knew he was going to come back with Isaac. And like Mary here and even Elizabeth, you know, sometimes when the Lord makes these promises to us, we're like, how are you going to do that? That's like impossible, right? But we have to understand that nothing is impossible for the Lord. And Abraham, I believe, he knew nothing was impossible for the Lord. He trusted the Lord and he knew he'd come back with Isaac. And I can tell you, once again, those years of caregiving, um, which I would have to say were the most difficult years of my life so far that the Lord has brought into my life. You know, once again, there were times where, you know, you just, you have no idea how you're going to get through that or how your mom's going to get through that. You know, it's interesting. Medical science tells you one thing, um, but the Lord always has the last word. The Lord will always have the last word. And, um, and we can just trust that nothing's impossible for him. So if, once again, if you're going through one of those seasons where you're, you're, um, your faith is truly, truly being tested, um, just remember that nothing's impossible for the Lord. He'll do what he desires. And his will is the perfect place to be. So um, just hold on. Hold on to the Lord. Now, in terms of ministry, you know, um, you know I've served in the church for a while now um, here and in Colorado, but you know, when you speak to people that serve in ministry, a, a lot of times when, when people are like called to plant churches or plant ministries or whatever the Lord's calling them to do, a lot of them will tell you that one of the biggest issues is finances. Finances, like how am I, how am I gonna pay for this? How are we gonna pay for that? And I know, you know, Pastor Angel and Robin can probably tell you a lot about that and maybe what they experienced when they planted this church. But a lot of people will be like, well, we cannot, we can't, I can't take that step of faith. There's, there's no money, there are no finances. You know, Pastor Chuck used to always say, where God guides, God provides. And, you know, church, if it's God's will, it's God's bill as well. And that's something we need to keep in mind. Um, so if the Lord's calling you to do something and there's all these obstacles in the way, things making you, you know, waver, think twice about it, question the Lord, you know, how are you going to do this? Don't look at those things. Just be obedient to what he's calling you to do. Just like Abraham here, knowing in your heart that the end result is going to be a blessing from the Lord. So notice that Isaac, he's carrying the wood for his own sacrifice up the hill. Abraham took the fire. He took the knife. You know, these are, you know, the most dangerous elements of the, um, of the actual sacrifice here. But notice what Isaac asks his dad. Right? He says, hey, where's the, where's the lamb for the sacrifice? Right? That's the most important um, element. And then Abraham answers him, God himself will provide the lamb for the, burnt, for the burnt offering, my son, is what he says. So once again, where God guided, Abraham knew that God would provide. And that's something we have to keep in mind. And then notice in verse 9, Isaac's willingness to, to lie down there at the altar it says, when they arrived at the place that God had told them about, Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood. He bound his son Isaac and placed him on the altar on top of the wood. Now, remember, Abraham was over 100 years old. Isaac could have, like, outran his dad. He could have, like, gotten away from all this. But instead of escaping his dad, he willingly goes to the altar. And a lot of times, all we hear is the faith of Abraham, but really, what about the faith of Isaac? His willingness to do what the Lord has told him to do, right? Through his dad. And, you know, scholars suggest that Isaac, you know, maybe 
was in his 30s. Some suggest he may have been younger. Um, but what we know is that he could have escaped this situation, but he chose not to. He was willing to go through it. And it sounds very familiar to our Lord and Savior, um, Jesus Christ, doesn't it? Um, so a nice foreshadowing there. Now, if you look in the next few verses, uh, 10 through 14, here we'll see God's merciful um, reprieve. So it says here, Then Abraham reached out and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And then he replied, Here I am. Then he said, Do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything uh, to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your only son from me. Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering in place of his son. And Abraham named that place the Lord will provide. So today it is said it will be provided on the Lord's um, mountain. All right, so... Abraham was about to slaughter his son, Isaac. And then an angel of the Lord calls to him and he tells him, hey, don't, don't kill your son. You've passed this test. And what's beautiful here is that Abraham feared God more than he loved his own son, Isaac. And can we say that about our own lives today? And even if you don't have children, but anything in your life, are there things in your life right now that maybe you love more than you fear God and you can't let go of those things. And they don't necessarily have to be bad things like sin and strongholds, but maybe even good things that you continuously put before God. So maybe there are Isaacs in your own life that you need to sacrifice, that you need to give to the Lord. And sometimes there's things that we do habitually that we don't even recognize them as things that are keeping us from being obedient to the Lord. And we have to really evaluate ourselves continuously. You know, the Apostle Paul speaks of this in the second letter to the Corinthians. We have to continuously assess and evaluate ourselves. You know, where, we're, where are we at? But notice here um, that Abraham's willingness to sacrifice Isaac, once again, it foreshadows the Lord's willingness to sacrifice his only begotten son, Jesus, right? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave, there's the action, his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That love there led to an action. It led to obedience. So remember that that everlasting life that we can experience is only possible when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, the ultimate sacrifice, right? We believe that Jesus died for our sins. We believe that Jesus was buried, that Jesus rose from the dead three days later. We recognize that we are sinners and we have an element of repentance in our lives. That um, is what makes us righteous in the sight of God. Now, just as Abraham had predicted, God provided an alternative to Isaac here in this, um, in this slaughter, in this sacrifice. It looks like a ram was available, right? There was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. And God will always make a way. God will always give us everything we need to remain faithful um, to his purpose and to his calling and to be obedient to him. And this is what we see here um, with, uh, with Abraham. So to memorialize this event here, Abraham names the place the Lord will provide. And we know the Lord will always provide just as he provided his son Jesus to take the place of our sins, to take the place of our, um, our filthiness um, on the cross, right? Because Jesus is our propitiation. He is the propitiation for our sins. He has play, paid the debt for us. Now, Isaac here is kind of a picture of what is to come um, in Jesus. Of course, in that time, Jesus hadn't been crucified yet, hadn't risen from the dead yet. But both Isaac and Jesus, you think about it, they were both loved by their father. They were both offered, they both offered themselves willingly. Um, both were sacrificed on a hill. Of course, Isaac escaped that sacrifice. Um, and both were delivered from death on the third day. 
And remember Isaac and Abraham, they arrived to that place three days later, right? And on that third day, Isaac was able to escape death. And Jesus, of course, escaped death as well and rose from the dead three days later, right? After he had been crucified and after he had been buried. So here we see a nice uh, foreshadow, a nice picture um, of who would come through the linkage of Isaac, that promised son. Now, if you look in verse 15, um, there we begin to see that God reconfirms his promise to Abraham in light of his faith. So it says there, then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself, I have sworn, this is the Lord's declaration. Because you have done this thing and have not withheld your only son, I will indeed bless you and make your offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your offspring will possess the city gates of their heirs, I'm sorry, of their enemies, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed by your offspring because you have obeyed my command. So here we have the angel of the Lord once again coming, um, speaking to Abraham a second time. And um, at this point, um, you can only imagine how Abraham felt. You know, he had been tested. He had passed this test. And we know that when there is obedience, there's always blessings, right? I like to call obedience the spout of, of blessings, right? The blessings will pour out out of obedience. Um, but since Abraham was willing to take um, the loss of his covenant son um, or offspring Isaac, God was willing to multiply his offspring. And if you read here, once again, it says, I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sand of the seashore. And that's a very interesting verse there because, um, you know, astrophysicists and geoscientists have actually estimated the number of stars that are potentially in the universe and the number of sands of grain that are on the planet. And interestingly, their estimates are about the same. It's 10 to the 24th power, which is septillion. That's like one with 23 zeros behind it. And that's a very big number, okay? Um, and what's interesting to me though, is that both of those, the number of stars and the, num and the number of sand grains of the planet, the number's about the same. And the Lord here comparing those two in this verse is, is I don't know, it's, it's a beautiful thing to me. Um, you know, as, as a believer, as a scientist, I think that's pretty cool. Um, it just reconfirms um, the realness of the Lord and the fact that he's created everything and that he's in control. Um, that was a beautiful thing for me. But anyways, what we know is that he's going to have a lot of offspring. It's a big number, okay? Um, and his offspring were promised both military victory and um, they were promised expanded territory. All the nations will be blessed through his offspring, right? And we know that Obviously, Jesus would come through that linkage or through that line of, um, of Abraham through Isaac. And if you look in the last, um, and I actually didn't read these. If you look at the last four verses here, just for completion, um, uh, let me see. Beginning in verse 20. So before I read these, what, what I want us to remember here is that the Lord will never waver. His promises will always hold true. And, um, and we see that here with Abraham. And, and that's why Abraham's going to be able to return to, to those two young men that he brought with him, um, with his son, Isaac. So in the last four verses here, I'll just read these because this also continues this promise. It says, now after these things, Abraham was told, Milcah also has born sons to your brother Nahor. Um, Uz, his firstborn, his brother Buzz, Kemuel, the father of Aram, um, Chesed, Hazo, Pildash, Jedlaf, and um, Bethuel, and Bethuel fathered Rebekah. Malchah bore these eight to Nahor, Abraham's brother. His concubine, whose name was Ruma, also bore Teba, Gram, um, Tahash, and Maaka. I probably said a lot of those names wrong. Um, but what we see here is the offspring of Abraham's brother, um, Nahor, who's actually mentioned, I think it's in chapter 11, or chapter 12 of Genesis. And... Um, through his wife, Milka and his concubine, uh, Ruma, uh, what we see here is that it introduces, in, introduces us to Bethuel, who's the father of Rebekah. And Rebekah would be Isaac's um, future uh, wife, 
Okay, and you can read about that in the next uh, few chapters there in Genesis. And once again, the Lord being true to his promise, okay, that the Lord would multiply Abraham's offspring. And, um, and here we have Rebekah fulfilling part of that promise um, with Isaac, okay? So in closing this morning, there were two main things that we talked about, okay? The first thing we looked at was God's command of Abraham and then Abraham's response to the Lord's command. And what we learned is that the Lord had commanded Abraham to carry out um, what many would call an extremely difficult task. And this was a task that would certainly test and reveal the quality of Abraham's faith. And yet, despite the difficulty of this, this call or this, this task, Abraham was willing to respond without hesitation, and he obeyed the Lord's command. Now, I can tell you as believers, hesitation in our lives when the Lord calls us to do something will always hinder growth and it will hinder intimacy with the Lord. So we need to try to avoid hesitation when it comes to doing the things the Lord has called us to do. I know that's easier said than done, but that's where our faith comes in. When you have that faith in place, that hesitation becomes smaller and smaller because you trust the person who's calling you to do something. So let us learn um, from Abraham as he responded to this command. The second thing we looked at was Abraham's offering of Isaac, okay? So through Abraham's obedience to the Lord, his willingness to offer up his only son, Isaac, that is the son of promise, um, what we saw was a combination of faith and works, okay? And we know from the epistle of James that you need both. One without the other is dead. And if you look in James chapter 2, beginning in verse 21, it says, Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works and offering Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see, that faith was active together with his works, and by works, faith was made complete. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called um, God's friend. And certainly that's a beautiful place to be. Um, and with this act, he certainly passed the test. And this showed a great quality of faith. And from that faith came that great quality of obedience. Charles Spurgeon once said, You and I must be willing to do what God tells us, as God tells us, when God tells us, because God tells us. But only strong faith will be equal to such complete obedience. And then, of course, when you think about Jesus, our Lord and Savior, the greatest example of faith and obedience, if you remember his agonizing prayer there in the Garden of Gethsemane, and those words he said out of faith and out of obedience, right? Nevertheless, not my will, but your will. Um, be done. And that's the heart we want to have as we continue trusting in the Lord and continue in our obedience to the Lord as brothers and sisters in Christ. Because remember, we're here to grow and to build the Lord's kingdom, but we need to have faith. That way we can be obedient to whatever that call is um, in our lives. Amen. So if you're here in person or maybe you're watching via the live stream and um, maybe you don't have a relationship with um, Jesus Christ, and you want to invite him into your life this morning as um, your Lord and Savior, I want to give you that opportunity. And um, if that's you this morning, if you could just close your eyes, bow your head, and, and repeat this prayer um, after me. Well, Heavenly Father, uh, this morning I come to you, and I want to ask your Son, Jesus Christ, to be my Lord and Savior. Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God, I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you were buried. And I believe that you rose from the dead three days later. I recognize that I am a sinner and I need a savior. Please forgive me of my sins. And I pray that your Holy Spirit will come into my life and change me and use me for your glory. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you um, prayed that this morning, we want to welcome you to the family of Christ. And as we always mention, um, I, I can assure you that there's a celebration going on in heaven on your behalf. 
And um, if you want more information on maybe your next steps, maybe you um, need to be directed to a Bible teaching church, maybe you need a Bible, anything like that, please leave a comment there in the comment section or you can uh, call the church. You can come visit us. We meet every Sunday at 10 a.m. Our building is located at the corner of Hondo Pass and, um, and Gateway South. So uh, we will continue praying for you. Um, we love you and we hope to see you um, again soon. So, uh, so bye for now.